his son claimed of a broken heart. And again, to put into perspective how recent all of our understandings of things are, I remember in my early days, uh, career going to conferences, and I'm talking now in the in the 1970s and early 80s, where somebody would mention Milankovic, and oh, immediately there'd be outcries. That charlatan, that crook, that don't mention that name here. And then, uh, as late as the late 1980s, I started going to conferences, and I remember one in Ottawa. And somebody mentioned Milankovic as a possible explanation for a temperature trend. And nobody questioned it. And now, of course, Milankovic is generally accepted by almost everybody. And so you see this pattern uh, of, of uh, people trying to bring new ideas, trying to look at things differently. And you see the problem is not just that the public uh, don't accept them. It's that it's within the academia. It's within the scientific community. Within, within that whole academic community that they're rejected and, and marginalized and so on. And um, so um, that's where the real, the real problem uh, comes. And, of course, in, in the case of, of the whole uh, global warming due to humans theory, um, uh, and we have talked about this, was that they took control of the science of it through the IPCC and the focus on CO2 and Morris Strong and what he did there and the, and the climatic research unit people um, whose emails were leaked. They were controlling the science side of it, the peer review process that we talked about. But Morris Strong then set up the Rio conference in 1992, where he and that's where the whole Kyoto thing was planned. And... Um, there he took it into the public forum, into the political forum, because that's where the NGOs were invited, that's where the environmental groups were invited, and um, and so that's where he took the the um, the singular scientific view into the public forum, and of course the public were then hoodwinked into this whole scam that we have talked about so much going on. But as I said, when, when you look at these stories of Milankovitch and of Wegener and, and so on, the struggle to get uh, to the truth and get to understanding is, is almost always a huge struggle because you're tackling uh, the people that hold the power, the people that have sold uh, a particular idea to themselves and to, um, to uh, the, the school system and so on. And so to try and overcome that is, is absolutely a, a huge problem. It's very easy for people that care about the planet, have a connection to the planet, are concerned about species and concerned about our environment. It's very, very disconcerting to try to get through the inner workings and the detail of this in such a way that people are clear. And so it's a lot easier to go along, to get along. The peer pressure about this is tremendous. I mean, I can tell you if I'm doing a show and I've had a handful of people not willing to talk to me and come on as a guest, having nothing to do, by the way, with the climate industry, that's how deep level this is being politicized. That's how governments and elected leaders are dividing people over it. I think that that is devilishness. When you can divide populations of people, families, friends, associates, people that are meeting each other who really should be talking about stewardship on all different levels, absolutely divided like as if a religion. That tells me that it's been deeply worked out and politicized. And that's the sad part. And do we let them get away with that? Do we as human beings allow our elected officials and celebrities to be effective at dividing us between believers and deniers. That architecture of conversation is a loser conversation. It's a losing purpose, and it has no leadership to it. When you have to divide people, you actually don't have something solid on the ground. And the other part of this devilishness is that people are being united to save the planet. I think people should be united anyway as much as they can. But the planet needs help on so many levels from so many people in every area imaginable, from the seeds we use to the food we eat to the water we drink to all kinds of things, to the gardens we can't grow anymore, apparently, 
to the farms that are now being controlled by big companies like Monsanto. So we all need to pull together. But we have had in our consciousness implanted a seed of consciousness that we're not good stewards, that it's not good enough what we're doing, that we're the problem. It's almost as if the leadership has convinced human beings that we're killing the planet. And the fact is that the big companies that think they have the right to stand in our Gulf of Mexico and get away with making our oceans toxic, this is an example, you see. No, it's not the people in the Gulf Coast. It's not they're killing the planet. It's corporations that are given the total leeway to destroy the entire Earth. That is part of the problem. And by the way, I'm a big advocate of non-polluting on everything from the food supply to the water to the air and all of that. And it's interesting that there's still no middle ground. There's no paradigm yet. There's no prepared paradigm for somebody to look into the detail. I've been on a 25-year mission that has absolutely nothing to do with my broadcasting that has to do with assisting this planet at this time in transition for humanity and the planet. And I'll tell you, there is no way anybody is going to tell me and marginalize me that I don't care. We're not on the same page because we don't care about the same things. You know, most people do care about the same things. Most people do want clean air. They do want clean water. They do want clean food. And they don't want seeds when the molecular structure of food is being completely changed. They don't want to be told they can't grow gardens. It's absurd. I totally agree with you. But it, it's um, um, one of the challenges that I had in my early days of, of questioning and challenging the climate thing was people would say, oh, well, you're, you're just giving uh, comfort to the polluters. And that really bothered me because I did not want to do that. There are polluters. There's no question about that. Um, and, and I finally decided, and it was about 15 years ago, that there was a greater danger in misleading people by getting them to think something with false information because once they found that out and inev inevitably they would find that out that uh, they, w they would get to the point where they say well we don't believe anything you tell us and um, we're seeing that now uh, with this whole climate thing and I think that that's a much greater danger um, in terms of, of um, uh, of what's happening. But listen, just to get back to the, the thing about um, uh, Tolstoy, here's an interesting quote from Tolstoy, um, a very fascinating man. He grappled with all of these fundamental things about life and religion and so on. But he wrote, this is a hundred years or so ago, he said, I know that most men, including those at ease with problems of the greatest complexity, can seldom accept even the simplest and most obvious truth, if it be such, as would oblige them to admit the falsity of conclusions, which they delighted in explaining to colleagues, which they have proudly taught to others, and which they have woven thread by thread into the fabric of their lives. Wow. Now, there, there, it, it's, it, it's a powerful it comment on, on, on what's going on here. And um, so... Yeah, I, uh, it, it, it's such a challenge to, uh, because, you know, and I, I've given speeches where people would come up after and say, look, we agree with you, but we're afraid to uh, speak out. And I have some sympathy with that. Absolutely, I do too. You, you know, you've got a mortgage, you've got children, um, and um, it's, it's the problem that's going on on that Gulf Coast right now, where the people are saying, well, yeah, we don't want the polluting of our Gulf, uh, our golf and our waters, but um, we need the jobs and we need the oil money coming in as well. And, and of course, one of the things that's um, interesting, um, uh, I used to give lectures about a guy by the name of Eric Heilbronner. He was, he was an American economic futurist, and he made the uh, uh, incredible observation, and I believe it was uh, uh, as early as the mid-'70s, and I talked about this in my political geography class, he said that multinationals are going to be the new nation states of the 21st century. Tragic. And that they, right, and that he said that they will not uh, be beholden to anybody because uh, what they'll do is, if they're operating in your country, 
and you start to impose on them or impinge on them too much, they simply pick up 